Welcome to the Tennessee Virtual Symposium for the Tennessee Triennial Artist Talk. This symposium is inspired by our current exhibits, which are part of the Tennessee Triennial. The Triennial focuses on Tennessee's existing visual contemporary art scene while fostering a connection to the wider contemporary art world. In just a moment, we'll begin speaking with the Parthenon's three triennial artists, Lakeisha Moore, Desmond Lewis, and Houston Cofield. You can meet two of them in person by attending the National Triennial Celebration tomorrow at the Parthenon from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Admission is free if you mention that you are here for the celebration, and remarks by the artists will begin at 2 p.m. The Parthenon is proud to be one of the selected venues for the Tennessee Triennial in Nashville. Other venues include the First Art Museum, Cheekwood, Fisk University Galleries, Vanderbilt University Fine Art Gallery, and the Engine for Art, Democracy, and Justice. We hope you have time to visit these other locations to help ensure the success of Tennessee's first ever triennial. The Parthenon's Tennessee Triennial Exhibit and the Symposium are made possible through the support of TriStar Arts, Metro Parks, and the Centennial Park Conservancy. The Centennial Park Conservancy partners with Metro Parks to preserve, enhance, and build upon the treasures in Nashville's Parthenon and helps present accessible, inclusive programming to share with our community and visitors. We are very thankful for their support. So without further ado, let me introduce our artist. Lakeisha Moore is a Nashville native who inspires others through art and education. She was an assistant professor in the art and design department at Tennessee State University and is now the gallery coordinator for Fisk University Galleries. Learning in community and through experience is where she thrives. Lakeisha's works deal with identity, memory, and belonging. The paintings and collages that Lakeisha created for this exhibit chronicle her personal journey of healing and transition after being diagnosed with lupus. The vibrant colors and tactile collages have been admired by the visitors in our gallery as they identify with her message of self-acceptance and growth. Welcome, Lakeisha. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Desmond Lewis grew up in Nashville and now resides in New Haven, Connecticut and Memphis, Tennessee. He is on the board of directors at the Metal Museum in Memphis and is currently a lecturer in sculpture and Fabrication Shop Coordinator at the School of Art at Yale University. Desmond created two sculptural installations for this exhibit and uses objects familiar to many visitors, but unfamiliar to most galleries, such as farming equipment, a pulpit, and fireworks. These objects are combined with sound and video that lead visitors to consider connections between Black farming, social justice, and box chevies or the commonalities between fiery sermons of black churches and pyrotechnics. Desmond, thank you for joining us. Hi, hi everyone, thanks for having me. And the final artist in the Parthenon's, tri uh, the Parthenon's Triennial Trinity is Houston Cofield. Houston is a photographer based in Memphis, Tennessee. You may have seen his work in national publications such as Garden and Gun, Travel and Leisure, the New York Times Magazine, and Southern Cultures. Houston's contribution to the Tennessee Triennial addresses grief, mourning, and loss in the wake of his father's murder. This is the first time these works have been on exhibit and will soon be part of Houston's second monograph, Death is Like a Door. Visitors have commented on the meditative quality of his black and white photographs and their contemplative pomp. Good evening, Houston. Good evening. Thanks for having me. The theme for this inaugural Tennessee Triennial is repair. Would each of you spend just a moment sharing what the theme means to you and how it impacted the work you chose to create for this exhibit? Um, Houston, can we start with you? Yeah, when I first got the prompts, uh, I initially had like a, a few different ideas. I was sort of in the middle of making the work that is on view right now. Um, and so, like, I guess right off the bat, it sort of felt felt compelled to show that work, but it was also a little apprehensive because just of how personal it is and it wasn't finished uh, at the time. 
So I was juggling a couple other ideas, but um, after about a year of continuing to make that work, uh, just the timing sort of aligned and it felt like I had, I had taken a break for a minute and just felt like this work was, was at a stopping point. Um, it's hard to always know like when, when something is finished, but, um, this felt like a good time to show the work. So, um, so yeah, sorry. I don't know if that like answers the question at all, but, uh, yeah, the idea for me was less about repair in a sense of like, um, a sense of like healing, but like, I think that with such a, so with with grief and that anyone that has lost someone or, or gone through that, um, it, you know that there's no real, um, I guess, repair or healing that comes from it per se. That's like a, um, it's like a, uh, you know, shutting the book on on what happened, but. Um, but I mean, yeah, repair in the sense that like, I feel as if I've moved through this, this process and I'm, I'm still moving through it, but, um, yeah, I feel like, feel like there has been healing along the way and the, hopefully the, the work, um, communicates that. Um, Desmond, how does repair factor into what you've created for the triennial? I think the two works are in the triennial talk about subjects that I've avoided talking about for a long time um, publicly, but have been like a pretty major part of my life, uh, fireworks and farming. Um, and I care about both of those things from the aspect of so social justice and how those two industries um, are pretty... Uh, conservative and historically uh, not diverse. Um, so the theme kind of totally fit in with what I was doing already, which is to basically attack an industry from an angle that it didn't really, um, doesn't really follow the mainstream. Um, so like the fireworks, I'm only interested in fireworks for communities that can't really afford them. Um, I can't tell you the last time I watched a fireworks show for fun. Um, and the farming uh, component of the work, um, it's been a, a long journey of putting my family's farm back into production. And um, I really only care about cotton farming um, and how uh, like that was historically one of the main staples that black farmers produce. But right now it's like less than 1% of U.S. black cotton producers or U.S. cotton producers are actually black. Um, so those two concepts were the main driving force of the work, and I'm interested in how they can be used to help repair communities. I was noticing your cotton hat when we were getting started this evening, and I, I thought about those conversations we had. Lakeisha, can you speak to the theme of repair? Yeah. Um, thanks for the opportunity again, Jennifer. I think part of uh, what I was thinking about with repair, I knew that much of my work was was more dealing with portraits, um, me seeking to affirm other individuals. Um, and I think when we, especially over the last few years, I think all of us have been in a space, particularly, you know, with with illness and and um, and sickness and, and, and trying to understand what that's like and how to move through it. Uh, I was uh, struck when I had to encounter my own um, bout of illness that was um, outside of what most people were, you know, kind of focusing on, you know, and at the time, and myself included, and, you know, and 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 so when when um, lupus, you know, came about, I wasn't, I was not unfamiliar with it, but um, having to deal with it on a, a more personal level. Um, it became the idea of repair became that much more important because we do kind of um, reach outside of ourselves so much to take care of others or to try to solve problems here and there. And sometimes uh, we we are afraid to or 
um, have not um, grieved for those losses that we deal with personally or, you know, with our body, physically, emotionally, mentally, um, spiritually. And so that's part of why I decided to take on, you know, this, this task of um, trying to describe um, my transition through healing uh, with my work. And I hadn't done that before. So I was like you, Houston, I was a little bit nervous because I wasn't sure it was it was very personal. Um, but I thought it was important because perhaps it can help someone else who who may be um, walking through that same or a similar journey. So. Thank you so much, Lakeisha. Um, so the Parthenon gets many visitors who come in not expecting to see an art gallery. Many of them come in as tourists thinking that they'll see the temple upstairs or Athena. Um, and I've seen some visitors coming into the galleries, not expecting to connect with the artwork, and they light up when they see the John Deere seed planter, or they start telling about their experience with fireworks when they see those. And Desmond, your installations have really caught people off guard. Once you have their visual attention, what do you hope that they gain from connecting with your artwork? I think my hope is that they just think about things from, even though these objects are pretty, uh, I guess common in the world, they don't necessarily have to mean some generic type thing. Um, like fireworks are often found across the South uh, for every holiday, even Christmas, which is kind of wild to me. Um, but like, just because a normal fireworks show caters for a certain group of people doesn't necessarily mean that fireworks shows that I do need to, or intended to cater to that same set of people. Um, I mean, also like that particular fireworks uh, object uh, is from a town that I think a lot of people should pay attention to. Um, that town had like the fastest depopulation rate in the United States, but they really care about artwork and care about um, just like upholding their community. Um, and I, I think the the planner piece, yeah, it just looks like a normal planner, but then it like sounds like a box Chevy, which you can find commonly on the streets of Memphis or even Nashville. Um, and I kind of want it to be annoying, but I also like, Culturally, like it really relates to some of the things that I'm really interested in. Um, of course, the the planner piece also has this kneeling pad, um, which I think forces people to think about like why is that there? And we live in a heavily uh, Christian area of the country, um, and people forget that you know farmers kneel just like Colin Kaepernick, Kaepernick knelt. Yeah, I've had people ask me what what is that red cushion there, and I'll tell them like. It's a kneeling cushion for when you pray and helping them make those connections has been I think, a really valuable thing. Would you speak about um, what it was like setting off the fireworks with the pulpit and, and that experience? Um, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was fun. <laughs> I think it was fun because of, uh, the person that my contact in Cairo is someone that really believes in me and I really believe in what they have going. Um, there's a fine arts center in Cairo that for the last several years has continued to grow from just offering like community events to offering now violin lessons to, um, I don't know, I loaned him some sculptures like three years ago that he has just been so excited about and takes such good care of and I don't ever want them back um because he's he's a person that yeah really just believes in his community and I think every time I go to Cairo and do like a fireworks show I'll go again for Memorial Day for the first time um for an arts and crafts festival that they're going to have um there's always just like support that he provides in the community um because I always do, I try to do those shows for free, uh, which in this business is like incredibly difficult because um, normal fireworks shows a thousand dollars a minute for a professional show, starting price. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just always fun to, to go to Cairo and 
to see people have enjoyment for something that um, they normally might not have that luxury of. And can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the idea to pair these spent fireworks with themes from sermons in the church? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think um, for the last year I've been making work about the Black church. Um, and one of sometimes churches last a long time, like three hours uh, for like a Baptist church service is what I would experience as a kid growing up. Um, but it wasn't until like the last five minutes that I actually start paying attention uh, to the sermon because the benediction or like close to the benediction is like when, you know, they really captivate your attention. Um, and I really started thinking about fireworks show on the same lens in the sense of no one really cares about a, fire, a 20 minute fireworks show until the last finale, which is usually the final minute. Um, and I guess I was also thinking about like my aunt uh, passed away in November and I was thinking about the end of that eulogy and how um, there was a line in that eulogy, God, God calls the shots. And I started to think about my relationship to that with fireworks, how one of the few times that I really pray in my adult life is before a fireworks show uh, because you don't know if all the fireworks are going to go off and you, there's so much like risk involved. Um, with something that's like three inches that could create a crater the size of a pickup truck. Um, yeah, I, I just started to correlate the two. Um, black sermons have an explosive ending, and uh, it'd be kind of cool if it could be paired with fireworks, too. We're hoping um, that we'll be able to have some kind of a, a fireworks finale for this exhibit. It's something we've been talking about and hoping for. So we'll see. We'll see what we can work with. Um, and Houston, you've done such a wide range of work from victims of natural disasters to the longstanding tradition of dirt racing culture in Tennessee and Arkansas, Mississippi, and Kentucky. This series, Death is Like a Door, is incredibly personal. Would you share with us um, maybe some of the stories that led you to select the places or the objects that you photographed for it? Yeah. Um, yeah, it, the work, like you said, is very personal. Um, it's about my father who was um, murdered in a random act of violence in 2019 and right before the pandemic. And so um, I began like photographing as a sort of response to, or just with, like a sort of way to um, kind of cope or uh, begin to heal through, through this process. And so um, initially I was like documenting um, family events and sort of like things that were given to us, like flowers and like a fruit basket. Um, and just sort of like, you know, like his grave site. Um, and was really just sort of like making pictures to, um, so that I wouldn't forget like what this was like for us uh, as a family and for, and for me. And um, through that, I began to really look at photography as a, more of a meditative act um, rather than simply documenting um, my experience of, through this. And so, but I think, yeah, so there's a mix of different kinds of pictures that are, that are um, represented in the show and a lot of pictures that are not. Uh, I will say it's it's very interesting, like having to think about what pictures to put on a wall versus like in a book or how to exhibit the work um, in a space, like a physical space, because my, yeah, I don't really think that way, especially with this, with this work in particular. Um, but I think it was helpful for me to kind of 
consider consider some different aspects of the work. So there's a lot of different pictures. Like I, I can go through a few here, actually. So this is a picture of my father's grave. Um, like maybe a week or so after he died, and I. I went to his grave. This was the first time I'd been to his grave site. Um, like prior to, or I guess after um, we had sort of done the whole funeral ceremony. Uh, and I think what this is sort of, this, this is a jumping place for the, the work as a whole. Um, I think like an aspect of like this idea that death is a door, a new way of seeing like, um the the new sod on the on the grave was kind of jarring to me um in a sort of like just very practical sense like this is what death is like you dig up a, a six foot hole and then you fill it with dirt and you put like fresh sod over the top and i don't know just something about that is uh it just speaks to the way a life is, um, I don't know, commemorated or ended. And I, yeah, I just thought it was, it, it kind of like, I think it says a lot um, to, and just about our burial practices in general. Um, but it was a jumping place for me um, thinking about, thinking about the door aspect and um, seeing it in a different way. Um, some of these pictures are not in the show. This is, um, and I will say a lot of these photos were just really taken over the last like three years. Some were on assignment or some were like, just, you know, I carried my camera a lot, uh, which I actually don't do very often. I keep my camera as more of a, like I go out and photograph intentionally when I want to, I not, I don't really react to my surroundings per se, but for the past three years or so, I've just tried to keep it on me uh, daily and just respond. It's kind of intuitively to scenes or objects, set, settings that I am in that seem to, um, feel aligned with grief. Um, and so a lot of these photographs are really a meditative experience for me. Um, so I'm just gonna flip through these. Um, these are in, in color in the show. Uh, They're not here, but these were uh, some dry clean shirts of my dad's uh, that I found in his closet like the day after he had died. Um, I was actually out of town and had to drive back to Memphis overnight from Knoxville and ended up like going to our cousin's house and then going over to my parents' house. And this just, this was like the first thing that I had noticed um, one of the first things I noticed when like I walked into my parents' bedroom and into their closet, like knowing I was going into this intimate space, um, as a sort of way to just like, I was in shock still, I think, and also just wanting to feel a connection to my father. And these are that for me. Um, these, I have so many memories tied up in going to the dry clean with my dad growing up. He'd go to this one dry clean in Memphis. Um, his shirts were always packaged this way. He was somebody who had like a pretty regimented routine. And for me, I think these speak to the idea of preservation con like and, and preserving this part of who my dad was. Um, and also feel very kind of, um, I don't know, they're, they're, they're sort of the, I wish these were in color, uh, but they're a bunch of like pastel colors, um, which if you're from the South, like, I think you have an idea of it's, my dad was like a business guy and conservative and, and grew up in, um, 
rural Mississippi. And so uh, he just had all this preppy clothing that I like, prop, like maybe wore growing up and I just feel a connection to, and it, it, there's like a warmness to the pictures, um, but also there's something sad about them too, I think. Um, with them just like being in this plastic wrapping. So again, like a part of the, a part of making this work was wanting to feel a connection to my dad and, and a closeness to him. And even though he wasn't around. And so I went to, um, I, I spent a lot of time in North Mississippi. Uh, he was a boy scout and spent a, a ton of time in the woods there. And so, just spent some time around um, some property that my grandmother owns and some other people own that I know he kind of grew up around. And he also just, he, he used to hunt in this area and he, he spent a lot of time in this landscape as well. Um, so again, like going back to the sort of meditative act of just wanting this connectedness to my father um, and making it's just like pretty formal landscape pictures yeah so i guess that photo is not in this group but it's a photo of really moldy fruit and i just set it on a backdrop and photographed it almost sort of like these shirts um just in the studio and so it was some some fruit that like someone had given us, I guess, like during the first week of uh, after my dad had died. Uh, just we got, we got so many cards, so many flowers, um, food, obviously casseroles, whatever. Um, but we were staying at my mom's, and anyways, it, like the room started to just like reek of something rotten and. And it like there was so much stuff in our room that this fruit basket had gotten pushed under our bed. And yeah, I just pulled it out and it just felt very aligned with what was happening at the moment. Um, so, um, but that's in the show as well. Um, yeah, I think that's maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to get out of this. Great to meet your family at the opening. Did they get to see any of these images as you were working on them, or um, did they express any preferences in what would be in the exhibit, or were they surprised when it was all kind of revealed? Um, yeah, to be honest, no. Like, there was not not much of a conversation um, about what was going to be shown. I think they had seen some of the pictures I had made, but never really seen them as a group or like a lot of them at the same time. So yeah, there wasn't much of a, much of a conversation or preference or anything like that. Um, I think my mom was a little hesitant to, to be shown. Um, and that's a little bit of an outlier. Um, one of those earlier pictures that I made, like, you know, within the first few months, um, Thank you so much. I know people really enjoy seeing them in the galleries and they've, I've overheard people making personal connections and sharing memories of their own. And I think that it's been a very meaningful experience for a lot of people. Good. And, um, Lakeisha, your work is displayed in the West Gallery, which is at the very back of the museum. And with the white walls and the bright colors, it kind of reminds me of a jewel box as I walk through it. And again, our visitors have really connected with your journey um, as you've expressed it through your artistic vision. And this is quite a different style for you. Mm -hmm. I imagine that it wasn't just as simple as like switching to something new. Could you tell us a little bit about how that change came about and what that artistic journey has been like for you? I was a little nervous because I'm so used to showing portraits and and um, I think as artists you do um, you kind of question you you can get in those moments, moments where you question yourself um, and at this point when deciding what to 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 show and and how to talk about repair 
um, I was in a space where I was very foggy. I was still kind of um, in, I was still very sick and I, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to share. And I felt like the other portraits that I had done weren't where I was now. And so I, I, I didn't think it was the the right space to, to show them in. Um, and so when the cloud lifted, um, I said, I know what I'm going to, to, to make work about. Um, because even as, as Houston mentioned, um, with the pandemic and, you know, and, and protests, the Black Lives Matter, you know, you, you had so much conflict and, and now there are discussions where we don't want to, you know, kind of face the truth or, or deal with history. Um, and all of us are facing our own truths, right? And, and, and this, um, I titled the, the, the work or the, the show Transformative Embrace um, for a reason, um, because, you know, in, in order to, for um, us to, to kind of learn and, and grow from, from certain aspects that embrace, you know, um, does have to kind of take place where you em embrace it, um, start to embrace the truth, start to embrace the history of what was, what is, um, and what might be to come. And so for me, that transformative embrace, you know, had to literally come, you know, with me accepting, okay, this is where you are. You know, I was a former athlete, but I couldn't, I couldn't run from maybe like a, a, a from the the door to the car, you know, at that point, right? And so you you kind of start to think about your life differently. You look at people differently, and and you um and you um start to appreciate, you know, not that I didn't before, but um, I took those moments of meditation um, and prayer in, in a, a, a different way than I had before. Um, and what I was learning from it was to simply live and embrace life um, when maybe before I was kind of still living in a box. Um, and so I took some old, um, some old pieces of prints, which I enjoy printmaking, um, as a painter, I really enjoy printmaking and that process, that step by step process. Some of the some of the imagery, you know, with the with the womb and with the um, with the the lattice work or the the rays of of sun, you know, came from a very um, particular point in my life. My mom, you know, have, had just had my youngest brother. I also um, lost someone who was very special to me from church. You know, an elder from the church and. And um, and he always encouraged me to 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 live and to travel and uh, to experience life, and so that was was recurring in my in my head again. Um, and so I wanted to include some of these old prints, you know, in in these collages. Um, collage work is really interesting to me as well because you're you're layering, you know, these these parts and trying to piece together. So uh, these words started coming dealing with repair, connecting, reconstruction, cradling, resurgence, right? So these these kind of all represented moments um, in along the journey that of course is, is still happening, but along the journey where, you know, I was trying to make these connections, um, trying to connect back to self, you know, because the self that I knew was changing, right? Um, and also connecting with family in a different way. I didn't tell anyone at first, you know, so I was, I, I kept it hidden because I didn't know what was going on, you know? So, so that's, that's, that's some of how we deal with, 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 with loss or grief or, or confusion. You kind of keep it to yourself, you know, for, for a moment. Right. And then um, the piece that I really enjoyed making maybe the most was cradling. Right. You know, so again, the, the, the womb motif comes in there, uh, these strips of paper, even the the act of sewing um, and stitching together, you know, was was also part. Of, you can you can see that the most in in the second one in our reconstruction. Um, but but the the textile coming off of the paper and just kind of this notion of um, wanting to hold on to 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 the parts of you that um, you thought were were your identity, right? But then um, also being able to let that go. Um, I lost most of my hair along the way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, you know, in a, another, a later slide. And, and 
I've I still have my locks. I'm still trying to figure out how to how to work through those pieces. Um, but that's also, you know, a part of of me that of the cradling, you know, the the act of cradling. Um, and as I said before, memory or as you as you said before, memory is something that I'm I'm very much interested in and I'm my work stems from that as well. And how you um how how we identify with the with the past, um, with a collective memory, but also with those personal memories that maybe have been passed on um, through our elders or our parents or our siblings. Um, these these pieces for me, um, transitions, measure of time on the on the far right here. Um, I used pallets. My dad is a, is a truck driver, and he collects pallets also. You know for 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 extra cash, you know, and and I love watching how he he stacks the pallets on top of his his, his truck, you know, when he when he goes to collect them. Um, I also work with my hands like my dad, you know. I'm, I'm and and I find it funny. I'm the oldest. I'm the only girl. I used to drive trucks with him, right? And so the the pallet for me became a way to um, connect to that physicality, right? I was gaining my strength back, um, and I was able to to lift these these objects, and I found this one on the far right in my dad's back in in my parents' backyard. I asked, I asked my dad if I could have it. You know, sure, you, you know, you can have it. <laughs> um, and so the, I, I liked I like using found objects or something about that as well. And and the two on the left, my dad actually constructed um, for me. You know, so um, again, how do you repair um, and rebuild? You know working together um, toward a common goal, a common effort. Um, and that's one thing for me that that also kind of stood out through this journey, you know, too. Um, even though I, 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 I didn't, I didn't um, ask for a lot of help from family, besides my fiance, I, I, um, I started to kind of open up a little bit along the way, right? And so, and I, I think that, that was, that was some of, some portion of that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the color, if I may, on the, the, the far right. Um, trying to figure out, you know, how to capture time and, and how do we measure time became something of a, um, a question for me. Um, this was also a meditative process, you know, trying to, or using the colors that were, that became important to me that were uh, connected to health and well-being um, stood out to me. And I, I, and I wanted to use that in a, in a literal way, um, using gradients of color, moving down this, this um, textured wall um, with these slits and notions, almost as if it was a step-by-step, -step, almost stepping stones um, along, along this path um, that was, I mean, I really enjoyed working with this with this piece and then the other two as well. Um, excuse me. Okay. Um, impermanence of skin was um, I kind of wanted to show some stages with this one because this was something that I was a little nervous, um, apprehensive about approaching this piece. I was I took a little bit of my printmaking process. Um, and included this, um, included that into making it. Um, skin became something that that I became very self conscious of. Um, after I was in the hospital, I just broke out in all kinds of spots. Um, my uh, fiance said that I looked like a leopard, you know, and it just so there's all these things, you know, just kind of. You know, I, I felt strange. I felt like a, a, a alien in my own body, right? And so, you know, how do you how do you figure um, how do you um, I don't know how do how do you look at yourself and 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 um, and see that this person has changed? But then also, how do you accept that change and and know that there's beauty in it? I would walk in the park and I would see leaves, or I'd see you know the the spots on the leaves and I would say, oh, that looks like spots on my skin, you know, and, 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 and so I, I found beauty in that, in that um, movement through the impermanence, you know, and the, um, the weight of skin and what that means, you know, for us too. I, I mentioned hair earlier, you know, hair, um, 
hair is connected. Well, well, I think of, of course, DNA when I think of the hair, the skin in the same way, right? Um, it it identifies us. You know, we we have these labels that we put on ourselves, right? Based on our skin, based on how we look. Um, and this is this process, uh, you know, has has taught me to to um, to work through that in a deeper way. Um, this is this is the 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 show that I'm in, and it's 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 going through this process, and and, and that's okay. And I think many people, you know, have to have to face that. And, and I think um, it's important to um, it's valuable to to not be afraid of, of of that. And I had to learn that because at first I was I was afraid. <laughs> Um, but it got better, you know. <laughs> um, I wanted to share this piece, Impermanence of Skin too. We radiate light or sit in obscurity responding to the gains and losses we encounter. Um, so having having those options of of how to deal with, with loss and sickness and illness. Um again, using this layering effect, you know, they um there are so many layers to us as as people we are complex individuals right and so taking the 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 layering of of handmade paper and placing it on on a surface you know and 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 working through um like the 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 lightness of color and form um this is what i was trying to do with with this piece here in permanence of skin too um and this this um yellowish turmeric type color was was something that i wanted to to use um not necessarily for um a light or sun right but but to try to capture this this energy you know that that was starting to to build you know as i as i started to get better you know from from the original space i was in um this was a, an important piece for me I, I, okay and lastly, um, I always share talk about this rebirth, who you always wanted to be. Um, again, like I said, I was losing my hair um, and I ended up shaving it off in November. Not not completely off, but it felt very freeing. And um, and I, you know, I, you start to see yourself again um, in this rebirth. And um, and you realize, OK, this is this is the person I've always wanted to be, essentially. Right. Um, because there's a freedom in in starting over um, and figuring out, OK, who am I now? Who is Lakeisha? You know, and in, in in this space and it and it changes how you operate with other people and you, and you become um, more true to yourself and in, in your body. Um, and I think you will give space for other people to to be true to themselves and in their own bodies as well. And so I think, I think that's been really important for me um, at this point to, to walk in, walk in courage and, and, and assist others in that, in that space to, to do the same. Um, I hope, I hope I made sense, but, but that's a little bit about, you know, some of, of what, um, what this work means for me. So. Thank you, Lakeisha. Um, and you're also involved in the Tennessee Triennial and other locations. Would you like to take just a moment to tell us about that? Yeah. So as um, oh, you mean um, with the with the work on at, at Fisk, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, working with uh, as a the gallery coordinator here at Fisk, we're able to and um, to work with many artists, and we're able also to to work with um, artists who have been long in the community as well as in, in the international community. And right now we have uh, the work up of, uh, of Professor Alicia Henry, um, who is in the in the in the gallery space right now. And so um, when you all get by, please do you know come visit the, the Carbon Mason Gallery so you can you know see her work on display as well. So, and um, I think that's I think that's about it. But I do have a, a yeah the online show up and maybe too I don't know if, was, if you're referring to that as well. But. <laughs> Thank you. Thank all of you for, for joining us and, and sharing this insight into your exhibit at the Parthenon. Um, we'll open it up for questions. 
Um, let us know what you've been wondering about. You can type your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I saw one come through earlier. Let me see if I can go back and find that for us. Almost got it. Um, this one's from Taylor. It says, for reflection, were there any art ideas that you wish you would have included in this past gallery? So is there anything that you were hoping to include that maybe just didn't fit into the show or something you'd originally planned on that didn't make it? Yeah, after I... I... Oh, me or anyone? I don't know. Anyone, you can go first. You started talking. One of the, I, I was wanting to, to, um, if I could have a whole room of palettes. I don't know something about the that I was, I was thinking of, of, about um, having more of of that that movement. Um, almost it made me think of uh, train tracks, you know, um, and then as well as working more um, sculpturally with with hair. So that's another element for me that I wanted to to kind of dive in. I guess I'll say something. Uh, I think for me, I'm I'm pretty happy with what I, how and what I put in the show. But if anything were to be added, would be more of the shirts. Like I have a lot. There's like probably I don't know, maybe. 25, 30 shirts that are in in this uh, same sort of plastic wrap package. And so thinking about, yeah, that's the one thing I think, like maybe even bringing the physical shirts into the show or, uh, yeah, maybe just showing more. I'm not sure what that, how that works. But, um, yeah, and then there's a lot of pictures that, that didn't get shown, uh, but mostly Mostly because thinking of, again, like how to how to communicate what I want to communicate in a physical space, uh, was really really like really exciting actually. Um, and I think most of most of those ideas kind of came out the day I was in Nashville with you, Jennifer. Like just looking at the work and like seeing it, like you know, in the space. Uh, but the decision to like have have that work hung on a lower, um, I guess, like plane than the normal 60 inches or whatever uh, from center. So, with, and forcing the viewer to sort of have this like, this downward gaze. Um, and yeah, just making those decisions um, and then the sort of diptychs and triptychs that are in the show that um, speak speak to time and, and like you're saying, like you should like measure, like the act of measuring time and how to what that means and in with the context of grief. So, yeah, overall, I'm I'm happy with the show. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what I put in the show is fine. Like, totally good with it. Wouldn't make any changes. Desmond, I know initially um, you had had this idea for casting a tractor in concrete, and that was something we were excited about at the Parthenon and also wondering, like, logistically how that would work. Um, you've been doing a lot with casting in concrete, right? Yeah, it's just, I don't know, 36-inch door. And I get a tractor through it, uh, it was just going to be pretty difficult. I mean, even getting the planner in there was... Uh, not the easiest thing in the world, but not the most difficult thing. Um, pretty happy with with what's in there, though. I appreciate you working with our building's unique logistics. <laughs> um, Houston, I think we have a question for you. This is um, from Lauren Buffard, our director. She says, first of all, I love the show. I think it's very impactful. I'm curious how the other work you do, commercial photography, um, or I guess this is for all of you, there's gallery management and teaching impact you creatively. 
Do they inform your work? Or provide a totally different outlet? Yeah, I mean, I guess in an ideal world, like the two would somehow seamlessly just like flow together perfectly. But I have come to the conclusion that they don't and that they have to be sort of separated. Um, because at some point, like commercial photography is monetary, purely monetary. Um, and, but I will like going on being on assignment and doing jobs, I think always sort of like opens potential doors to, to thinking about something or, you know, can inform personal work. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful for the, the type of work I'm able to do, um, commercially and editorially, um, because although it doesn't like always purely align with, with, um, my personal work, I think that, uh, there is a lot of creative freedom granted by editors and certain editors and people that you get to know. Uh, through working with them more and more. Like, for example, like the New York Times asked me to shoot something last, like in 2020, basically like off of the work that I was making about my dad um, and just like relating to the pandemic and like how to measure time and, and what grief looks like in, in that context. And um, so, I mean, like that, th that's like a rare moment where it's like, oh, this feels this feels aligned and feels like I am actually able to just like make, uh, make the work I'm already making for a publication and just have it, have it published. So, um, but yeah, for the moment, like I, I draw a pretty distinct line between the two. Um, but not to say that, that, uh, yeah, a lot of, I think a lot of jumping points, points of departure have happened through, going on assignment and witnessing witnessing events and things, meeting people and seeing new places. I was told by one of my one of our colleagues here, Alicia Henry, um, to even if it's just thirty minutes or an, a, a day or you're in the studio, do it right. And 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 that taught me um to even if it, there, there doesn't seem to be the time to do all of it right. You can make time so it gave me so much agency you know to say hey wait a minute set up set aside this time for me because i needed that that creative space you know because when you're when you're teaching all the time so much of your energy goes to you know the teaching and and and, and getting the the grades in or and making assignments you know and um it, it definitely keeps showing your toes because when you're when you're asking your students you know to experiment and and, and work on process and and consider process over an end product you're also going to do the same in your studio, right? And so that that's that's something you know to 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 try to emphasize the importance of a process and what you learn along the way. Um, and I think I'm learning the same thing in the gallery setting. You know, when you're when you're lighting a show or when you're um, assisting in curating, you know, and kind of moving it around and moving. Oh, excuse me moving the work around you know, in the space and, and what that looks like, you know, it's all about this, this process of learning and growth and um, evolving. And so I, I think, you know, teaching and also working here is, 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 has helped me to evolve as an artist. Um, but it, it also shows me the importance of making that time, you know, and, 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 and choosing to, to separate and carve out that time to, to work and maintain that practice. Well, Keisha, we have a question. If somebody's interested in seeing your online exhibit, could you post a link for that? Um, and I do want to point out that we'll have uh, a digital version of the Parthenon's Tennessee Triennial exhibit, hopefully available soon. Um, Desmond, did you want to speak to that question as well? Teaching is an interesting venture that Sometimes I feel like it uh, negatively impacts my practice because I just don't get so much time to work in the studio. Um, I've been trying to change that though, um, traveling to Tennessee every week for the last three months. Um, so, I mean, I, I love the creative energy that my students provide me, but then at the end of the week, 
there's uh, kind of a little bit left in the tank um, to make work. But um, I'm always thinking about new work, and I appreciate those conversations that I have with my students um, and the creative energy that teaching affords you. Um, hopefully, one day there'll be like more of a like work life balance. But right now, it's just teaching is it. All right, I know we're we're almost at time, but we have um, one more question that I'll ask all of you. Um, this is from Eloise Freeman. She says, what do each of you do to encourage and develop the artistic creativity in regular folk? Well, outside of teaching, I'm, I, I have the, the privilege to meet people like Eloise Freeman um, and have beautiful conversations just about uh, communication and expression. Um, and in those conversations, um, affirming um, the voice that each of us have uh, and, um, and the choice that we have in the ways that we express that voice um, and what we want to communicate. So I, I think, um, or I believe that, that all of us you know, have something to say and, and we, we're all markers of, uh, of culture in our own way. And what we choose to express is important, especially, um, you know, because there are these expectations, you know, there's this 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 academic approach and there's this approach, you know, the, we, we have folk artists, right? And and um, I've been saying this a lot and I think I've been encouraged that there is space for all of it, you know? And so even if you're not showing your work in a gallery or museum, you know, you're, you're making it for yourself or you're making it for someone else, right? And so I, I think that's the, uh, the the valuable part of of, of making work um, because you are getting it out there and and so having conversations and speaking with people uh, that's that's one way I, I, I like to encourage you know uh, um, others to, to to make work. Yeah, I think like you should, like that's a pretty thorough answer. I don't know that I can add anything to that, but just making work for yourself I think is huge and. Yeah, I, yeah. I just think that's that's probably the best way to approach uh, approach approach becoming an artist or or uh, starting to like work out some ideas. Uh, as long as you're doing it for yourself first, and I think that's you're on the right track. Part of this is like having my studio uh, remaining based in Memphis. Um, which is known for like its blue collar mentality um, and like working class. And I think a lot of what I see every time I like fly home um, really impacts my work and um, allows me to also think about ways that when I finish my studio building, um, like I can invite the community and to, to also partake in the, um, one of the things I'm super excited about is uh, building a community-based foundry as a part of my studio um, to be able to have people come in and cast iron. Well, I want to thank all three of you for joining us tonight and answering everybody's questions, especially mine. I just I have endless questions <laughs> for all of you, but we'll stop here. Um, I want to remind all of our viewers to come to the Nashville Triennial Celebration tomorrow at the Parthenon from 1.30 to 3. Again, you can get free admission when you come. Just mention at the ticket counter that you're here for the celebration and they'll let you in. Um, Leticia and Desmond will be there and speaking at 2 o'clock tomorrow. And I also um, want to remind you that this video will be posted on our YouTube Symposia page. There's a link in the comments if you're interested in that. Um, we'll also be having another Symposia on, oh, I've lost the date. It's, it's early April, but we'll have a link in the chat for you. Um, this is part of our upcoming series on um, archaeology. Uh, the title is Not Black and White, Seeing and Naming Africans in Greek Art. So we'll have that link in the chat soon so you can register for that in April. Um, I really hope everybody gets a chance to come see the Triennial Exhibit at the Parthenon. It runs through May 7th. Um, opening May 19th is a traveling exhibit of wet plate photography by London Amara. 
titled The Alchemy of Spirit and Light. And then opening July 13th, this role of a replica, a hands-on exploration of what accurate replicas can teach us and how they are used to convey the latest discoveries of the ancient Parthenon. So thanks again to everybody for joining the symposium. We hope you've had a wonderful day and we look forward to seeing you at the Parthenon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're the first to know about all the exciting things happening at the Nashville Parthenon.